Hello and welcome to It's All About You, the best show about you on the internet. I am B. Dave Walters, life coach, writer, talk radio host, and I'm going to do something I don't normally do. I'm going to move my camera just a little bit, okay? This is episode number 66, Enlightenment, or Becoming Enlightened. Becoming Enlightened, because it is a process. So here's an interesting thing. I've been looking into this quite a bit lately, as, as I shared with you last week. Cause, you know, some, some fantastic things have been happening, and I'm always looking for opportunities to learn and grow and take on new things. And this idea of, like, enlightenment and what enlightenment really is was always interesting to me, because... You know, it, it, it's kind of one of those things, it's like that old saying that uh, Margaret Thatcher had, that it's like being powerful is like being a lady. If you have to tell someone you are, then you aren't. So, usually, most teachers, I'm always kind of skeptical when they walk around, like, oh, I'm enlightened, I'm enlightened. It's kind of like, I don't really think you should have to say it like that. So, I've really been looking into what it means to be enlightened. And I believe, I believe... I have discovered a very simple definition of what it is. And let me tell you in advance, even as we're about to talk, how this relates to me. And what, what I find, my conclusion, after working at this for like, I don't know, 15 years now, is that enlightenment is not about like living on a mountain and just kind of living in a cave and being like a yogi somewhere. It's, it's more about a state that you exist in, and I think it's a state that you can move in and out of. And I believe, like anything, the goal is to spend more and more time there. So, and, and it's not, not, mean, uh, a state where you're like a robot, for instance, where you're just kind of like this, like, completely zen, you know, person with no, with no emotions and no feeling. So let, let's talk a little bit about what it is, and then I'm going to show you some ways that this has shown up for me, and maybe some ways that it's shown up for you, and how you can make it show up more often and spend more time in this state. Does that make sense? Okay. One thing that I saw consistently, personally, I think it's made up of two parts, and really these two parts are just one part. But one thing I saw again and again and again, which was interesting, was a big part of the definition of what enlightenment is, and it was also the definition of just what a really intelligent person is, which this was interesting, is a skill, skill, that is called metacognition. Metacognition. What do you think that means? <laughs> okay? Alright, what metacognition is, is the ability to think about the fact that you're thinking. Okay? You follow me? It means that just because a thought pops into your head, you don't instantly accept it. Remember, we've talked about this before, that just because a thought pops into your head doesn't mean that you have to believe it. Right? And so even though things are coming in and out of your awareness, you can still observe them with some level of distance. Does this make sense? That you don't instantly just accept everything that pops into your brain, or worse, just act on everything that pops into your brain. Right? So that's both a hallmark of intelligence and of being an enlightened person. And, and the reason why this is, quite frankly, is that, you know, you can't always trust the things that pop into your head, like we just said. Because yeah, sometimes that, that's coming out of your own past conditioning. It might be somebody, what somebody else said to you, what you were taught, what you heard, what you saw in a movie. You know, there's always things bombarding you constantly. Right? But it doesn't mean that you actually have to accept any of them or take them in. Does that make sense? And I'm going to tell you something that happened to me lately. Two things that happened to me lately that relate just to this. But before I do, let me tell you, this is how I define enlightenment. Okay? And it's very simple. And it's something that everybody has experienced. Well, no, not everybody has experienced. Let me not say that. But everybody has the ability to experience if they put in a little bit of work at it. And it is this. I define enlightenment, not just me, but as a you know, basis of all the stuff that I've studied, which I think you know by now is a couple things, is the ability to separate yourself from your emotions. That is enlightenment. When you can feel something, when you can have a response... Because I don't think you ever get to the point that you don't have the response. Does that make sense? Like, I used to think you get to this point, again, that you were like this Zen robot, right? That things that happen to you, you no longer, you know, had a perception of how you felt about it, right? 
But I see now that that's not true. You know, I mean, you can take the best monk in the world, and if you hit their toe with a hammer, they will be aware of the fact that their toe's been hit by a hammer. But the difference between them and most everybody else is their immediate response to that and what they make that mean. Does that make sense? And I'm going to tell you how I discovered this, what it was that, that helped me realize it. In the Bible, the scene where Jesus turns over the money changers' tables in the temple, he gets upset. I mean, and he's described as being mad. And he flips over the table and kicks all the money changers out of the temple. Now, what I took from that is if Big JC is able to get angry, then apparently anger is not, you know, <laughs> that, that, that doesn't knock you out of the running for being enlightened. So, what that means to me then, again, is your ability when you have these feelings, when you have these emotions, when you have these responses, that you can observe it and see that yes, yes, I'm feeling angry right now. Right? But it doesn't mean that you instantly, by extension, say something you don't mean. Or punch a wall or break something or do something stupid. Right? Or you can be aware of the fact that I'm feeling anxious right now. And that it's okay to feel anxious right now. Because again, your emotions are a navigational system. That's all. They're bringing you data. You know, of your environment and your relation to it. But the thing is, they cannot always be trusted and they tend to be faulty unless you've trained them. Because it's a skill. Remember I said metacognition is the skill of being able to think about thinking. And so what can you really do with this? Now let me tell you, these are two things two, this week that happened to me. Two friends that I've had for a while now, uh, Facebook friends, but we, you know, we've talked beyond that. We've talked on Skype, you know, video call, phone, whatever. Two friends got mad and turned their backs on me because they were upset that I knew someone else on Skype, right? So like you and I are friends, but then you get mad at me because I'm friends with another person, and because of that, you don't want to be friends with me anymore. Now, I don't need to go into the whole story, but the issue is this, and what I explained then, and I think if you know me, you know this is how I operate. My thing is, I'm not here to judge, right? Because if I get into the place of where I'm passing judgment on people about who they are and what they do, then I can't do my work anymore. I can't coach that person or help that person. The thing is, I only look at things through the lens of, you're either making decisions that are or are not serving you. Does that make sense? It's not about right and wrong. It's not, to me. You know, it's just that is the things that you're saying and the things that you're doing, are they going to advance you and lead to your long-term happiness? Or are they not advancing you and going to lead to your long-term unhappiness? I'm other, other than that, I'm not here to judge. Unless, you know, you're hurting children or something, then obviously i got to say something. But besides that, because you have to make your own choice as an adult. Okay? Nobody can decide what's right for you but you. Okay? But by extension, nobody can make meaningful change in your life but you. 100% of the responsibility and 100% of the accountability lay with you. Now, what that means for me is that I cannot allow someone else's insecurities to become my insecurities. Does that make sense? I cannot allow the fact that you don't like this person to make me not like this person. But by the same token... I can't let this person make me not like you. Does that make sense? Because then I'm not any good for anybody anymore. Right? Then it's just situational. Then I'm just, you know, palling around with people whose company I enjoy. And the necessary distance in the relationship is destroyed. This is what I was talking about last week. I don't share a lot of things because I need to keep that distance. Because have you ever heard the saying, familiarity breeds contempt? This is why people become too close and then they believe they can make demands and expectations of you that they cannot make. Now, for me, in this, in this case, and for one of these people, I said directly, you know, I care about you. I mean, I've been here for you. I've literally listened to you cry and stayed up late with you. I don't know how many times, but I can't let your insecurity become my insecurity. 
And in this case, both of these people chose that they would let their insecurity make the choice and they would just go cut me off. But so be it. Uh, hopefully, hopefully we can reconcile it and move on, but I, I'm not going to budge in this. I cannot let their feelings cause me to alienate someone else who might need my help for whatever other reason. I can't do it. It doesn't mean I don't care. Actually, it's because I care, because I care about everybody equally that I can't do it, right? Now, for you and the situations in your life, you have to look at where might this be taking place? That you might be having people in your life that are putting these unfair demands on you. Like, I can give you another example. One of my students, yesterday, doesn't show up to class. I have another one of the students text him because I know they're friends. He's like, I quit my job. I'm quitting school. I'm, I'm moving to Chicago. This is the message he sends. And this is a stable guy. You know, we've talked. He's a career man. He's got, you know, a little girl that he's really passionate about. I had worked with him and coached him and helped him get a raise, a big raise at work. I helped him get like a 30% raise. So his life is going like this. And then out of nowhere, he's like, I'm throwing it all away. Now, what's the one thing? And man, I mean one thing. That make a guy pull up stakes like that and just throw in everything and take off. A woman. But in this case, it actually was not his woman so much. It was his little girl. His ex, who he's not with anymore, had taken his little girl and moved. Didn't tell him where. So, of course, he's freaking out. And he's just going into, I gotta do something, I gotta do something, I gotta do something, I gotta do something. Which any body with kids, especially my brothers out there, you understand that, you know, you can't do that. You can't take a man's child, especially his little girl and bail. You know, that doesn't work, right? But what I went into immediately in helping him was, well, first thing you got to do is calm down, okay? Don't do anything crazy. Don't do, you know what? Hang on a second. I, I have to send this message because I got somebody that I've been waiting waiting for who just popped up to send me a message and I don't want to miss them. Sorry, I apologize, but that had to happen. Okay, like I said, don't do anything crazy because it's not going to help. Okay? What difference does it make? Quitting your job is not going to change anything. You know, so I was like, talk to your boss. Tell your boss the whole story so your boss knows where you're coming from. You know, this guy's worked for, for years at this company, so they know him. They know he's solid. Let them know the story. They're probably going to give you a little bit of room to figure it out. Funny story. They gave him room to figure it out. They were like, take all the time you need. Don't worry about it. Get it settled. I was like, second thing. Don't go looking for her. Don't go to her mom's house beating on the door. Anything crazy because it's not going to help. I was like, calm down. Call the police. Tell the police the entire story so that you will then know what your rights are and what your rights are not, okay? Does what the mother of your child did, I hate to say baby mama, but in this case she's well and truly a baby mama. Does what your baby mama did count as kidnapping? Because if it is kidnapping, then you got cops and FBI that will try and find your little girl for it and you don't have to worry about it. But if it's not kidnapping, you have to be careful because if you go and you find her and then you take your little girl and leave, then maybe what you're doing is kidnapping. Does that make sense? The point is how this all relates is I understand that he was going through the most stressful thing that he could possibly go through. Okay? Not knowing where your child is and not knowing if your child's in danger because apparently the girl moved in with some shady guy. Not knowing where your child is, that's stressful. I understand that, but it didn't change the fact that he had to be able to take a step back from it and be like, okay, I feel these emotions. I feel this insanity. I feel panicked and scared and crazy and like I've just got to do something. But he still had to be able to step back from that and think with his head. Okay? Which in turn, he did. He called the cops. The cops said what she did was uh, considered kidnapping. And the cops have been on it. And they got his little girl back in less than 24 hours. Now, of course, more insanity is going to go along with this. And there's more to the story. But I don't want to say too much in case you know the guy or you know the girl. But it's just a lot of insanity. But the fact is, cooler heads prevail. Right? Now, think about this. In my case... 
what could I have said? I could have been like, yeah, man, you need to go find her and kick his this and, you know, slap her that and, you know, go get your gun and this, that, or the other. You know, let's go get it together. Call your boys. I'll call mine. Let's go. Let's ride out. You know, right. But that wouldn't have changed anything and it would not have helped. Okay. So when you get into these situations in your life where maybe you're getting upset, maybe someone else is getting upset, you have to cultivate this skill and it is a skill of being able to step back from the chatter in your brain, to step back from the emotions, to step back from even the thoughts and let the real you, the real you from inside make the decisions. That's the one that can hear the inspiration. That's the one that can allow, allow the best possible action to come forth. Remember we talked about this last week. This miracle process was not about doing, it was actually about not doing. Or at the bare minimum, doing all you can and then allowing the universe to do the rest. Okay? So, I ask you, is there a situation in your life, is there a relationship, for instance, that you know you need to get out of? And yet, you continue telling yourself things, but I love him, but I love her, blah, 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 blah. You've got to be able to step back from all of that and really look at it objectively. Okay? To pay attention to your thoughts and pay attention to your feelings. Because once you start paying attention to them, then you can start to see where is this really coming from. Right? Whose voice is this really? Right? There's something online. I don't have time to go through it with you right now, unfortunately. But it's called Big Mind. Big Mind. If you Google it, you'll probably find it. Or it's best if you look at Google Video. And see if you can find the video for Big Mind mind. The big mind process is amazing. But a part of it is identifying all these voices and chatter and, and things that are going on in your mind that aren't really you. You know, have you ever heard yourself say something and it was just your parents' words coming out of your mouth? Right? Or it was your preacher's words coming out of your mouth? Right? See, you've got to start taking ownership and responsibility of who you are because it's not until you take ownership and responsibility of who you are that you can start tapping into all the power that you've got inside okay and the first step is to not absorb other people's fear and anxiety and insecurity that they will try and heap on you and unfortunately when you don't accept people's fear and insecurity and anxiety some of them will turn on you and not want to be around which is painful but so be it because here's the fact if somebody puts you in this situation where they're like do this or you don't love me do this or I'm never gonna talk to you again well then they don't really care about you that much to begin with because if they can so easily write you off, like in this case with these two people, for all we've been through, I'm like, really? That? I do one thing you don't approve of and we're not cool anymore, hmm? It's interesting. I mean, that shows me what I meant to you. And I realized the response that it was supposed to generate was me being like, please, please, no, please. I'm like, nope. Sorry. I love you. I love you. I mean, I hope we get it sorted out, but it is what it is. I mean, I'm not going to chase you. And more importantly, I'm not going to conflict with, you know, my own principles and, and morals and what it is that makes me me. And the thing that makes me me is that I'm available for everyone and love everyone without judgment. And I don't even judge my two friends. I can't say that they were wrong for, you know, well, not wanting to talk to me anymore. So be it, you know, maybe our relationship is at its end. Maybe it's run its course. And while that does disturb me. It doesn't disrupt my selfhood. Does that make sense? I am aware of the fact that it's disturbing, but it doesn't change, you know, what's so, or the reality of, of the situation, or the reality of what it is that I have to do next. And when you can see things impartially, then it helps you be able to approach things clear without making things so personal. Does that make sense? So I'm about out of time based on my giant stopwatch. But you are great, and I love you. Find me anywhere, Facebook, MySpace, Twitter, or my one webpage, about.me forward slash B. Dave Walters. It's sexy. Check it out. About.me 
forward slash B Dave Walters. Pay attention to your thoughts and feelings, but you don't have to believe them. Bye.